Welcome to space. We're going to be exploring space in a landscape painting today and creating space. So I'm often going to be referring to it as depth rather than space because for me in a landscape, I'm often thinking about how to create depth. We're going to be doing a painting a little bit like this one and then another simpler landscape. In order to create depth in a painting, what we want to be thinking about is aerial perspective. And we'll briefly touch on linear perspective, the other main type of perspective. There's probably more types of perspective, but um, uh, we're just going to talk about aerial and linear. And then the other type of space in a painting, and that's why it's referred to as space rather than depth, is because you have the positive and negative spaces. So you've got the positive tree here and then there's this negative space or this negative space you've got a positive tree here and again this beautiful negative space this one this one all these little negative spaces so space refers not just to how to create depth but also refers about positive and negative space we could do a whole video just on positive negative space in with a different subject um, particularly like um a still life, really awesome way to create beautiful, interesting, positive and negative spaces. But for today, we're going to be talking about landscapes because um, you guys have talked about landscapes in the past and wanting to create them. So what we're going to be doing is talking about how to create the illusion of space. I've got four awesome ways to create aerial perspective and they are really easy to master. Um, one of them is a little bit tricky, I suppose. Three of the four, I should say, are really easy to master. The positive and negative space. I'm going to wait to hear from you about whether or not you'd like to do another um, YouTube live session just on positive and negative space because it is so fascinating when you start to create, when you start to focus not just on your positive space but those beautiful negative spaces between your positive um, spaces. So two landscapes, one like this and one a simpler one. Both of them, however, are going to be about aerial perspective. Now, in order to think about aerial perspective, these are the four things that we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about texture. So texture in terms of aerial perspective is put texture in the foreground and not in the background and barely in the middle ground. Put values, you want to be thinking about your values. So again, this painting is quite a good example of the uh, use of values. Darks for foreground objects. These are all ideas. They're not necessarily um, some rules. So you can break any of the rules that we cover today. But I've used texture in the foreground, a little bit of texture over here, um, lots of texture on the tree trunks that are in the foreground. And that's all about aerial perspective, no texture in the background and text, but only texture in the foreground. In terms of values, I've gone from lighter tones to some mid tones and then I've gotten darker. So again, I'm using value to suggest that things are closer to me and things are further away. Further away, we get little value, light colours, and as you come closer, you get darker closers. And Again, I can't say enough, these rules, these suggestions are meant to be broken. Now, colour is the most interesting aspect of aerial perspective um, and that will involve a little bit of using colour and graying them down and we'll talk about that when we come to it. And then the other one is contrast. So they all tie into each other so easily, not easily, they tie into each other kind of, you know, there's a bit of contrast in value. There's a bit of texture in, no, there's not. They, they all relate to each other. I'm not quite sure where I was going with that. Anyway, what I wanted to talk about is, oh, contrast. I was up to contrast, yes. So, again, you've got um, dark areas next to light areas and hopefully most of that 
um, contrast is occurring with the objects that are in the foreground. So, for example, there's very little contrast between this background tree and the sky next to it, or this background tree and the sky next to it. So from that tone to that, that, that to that. So it's about value and contrast, isn't it? So there's very little contrast between those two objects, but these sticks are dark, the lines are hard. That's the other thing that we're going to be um, talking about. These hard lines are for objects that are in the foreground and not in the background. So uh, we'll be doing two landscapes, one with the tree trunks. So um, when I'm doing these YouTube lives, I log in early and give you a couple of um, uh, references, a, a couple of ideas about references. So if you, um, I'm always <laughs> logged in by, uh, you know, 15 minutes at the minimum, because I come in and check all my equipment's going beautifully. Anyway, the point is I have an image of tree trunks that I'll be referring to, but I can put this one in um, camera in, within the camera space so that you can refer to this one. It's a beautiful gum tree and it's a scribbly gum because it's got that fabulous scribble and I thought, oh, wouldn't that be brilliant um, as a type of texture, texture that is in our foreground. Um, tree trunks and then the other image that I have, is an image of a mountainside. So both of these are New South Wales. Uh, I live in Sydney and go on holidays in outback New South Wales all the time, particularly the south coast. So uh, these are both from the south coast of New South Wales. So I've got this particular photo of a lovely holidaying spot we go to sometimes with friends. And it's got this beautiful mountain shape there. Then there's a mountain shape here, a mountain shape there, 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 and then there's a whole stack of trees. But in reality, I'm not going, to, I'm going to fold it up so that I'm not even distracted by it, just folding that one up. I don't want to put those trees in. I don't like painting um, lots of foliage. I find, you know, it's a bit random for me whether that's going to work. So not going to put that in. I'm going to put in a much simpler type of foreground that might look a little bit like water. And I'm again, I'm going to show you every step of the way how we're going to be doing that today. They're the two photo references that I've got going. Um, we will so be talking mostly about aerial perspective today. And um, although it's got this wonderful complex sounding title. It's not at all complex. It's not like um, linear perspective. Now that requires a lot of thinking, a lot of uh, accuracy. And I'm going to show you a painting here that involves one point perspective. Now um, I got this idea of Pinterest and then adapted it to make it mine. Um, I do have lots of photos because when I was going through the phase of teaching One Point Perspective, um, and I also taught Two Point Perspective, I gathered lots of images where there were roads, paths, something that I could make interesting. But the reality that was that this, the photo I worked from, was not at all wet. So I got that idea from a painting on Pinterest and I'm sorry that I can't <laughs> direct you in that uh, way. But this is a painting that we could uh, easily explore on, an, uh, on um, another whole video because it's quite easy to do. And it's this looks wet because the pink is reflected and the pink is reflected, the green is reflected, the green, the blue, they're all reflected down into this very simple, this is an excellent example of linear perspective and it's just using one point perspective so there's one point and all the lines lead up to one point and then I've put in a cute dog and two people as though they're talking to each other and again they have these little tiny um, reflections so that's why you get the impression that this is um, watery right Oh, Lena says, yes, please. So is that yes, please, to the do linear perspective on another week or the positive and negative spaces 
on another week. I'd love to hear what you're thinking about that. Hey, thanks, Dave. And, oh, thanks, Lena, your compliment there too. And Helen does too. She loves it too. Thanks to both, Lena. That's wonderful. There is so much to explore, isn't there, in um, painting generally that you could just, as we will, we'll go on for ages enjoying ourselves and creating beautiful paintings or what you might paint instead and what I often paint in the first time that I'm painting is is a lovely um, abstract that I can cut up and use for something else. And there's a bit of learning. Okay, so there's my two images and let's talk next. Oh, just going to move that one out of the way. Later on, I want to talk also about... Um, this painting because there's something very wrong with it and later on I'm gonna uh, ask you if you can work out what is wrong with it. So let's talk equipment and uh, colour, what I've got in front of me. I've got a colour wheel, I've got a little bit of um, these metallic paints, I thought that might be quite lovely. Oh the reason why I've got this here is because this is what we did last week and uh, we were doing textures which was awesome fun and we created that little cutie. Now the reason why I've kept this here, if, especially if you were here for last week's um, tutorial where we used the, those um, beautiful inks, the alcohol inks. I wanted to just show you that is all alcohol ink. Go straight through your page. That's totally by the by. Get rid of that one. Now, a little bit of reflective paint because at the end of the painting, sometimes a little bit of reflective paint can just draw in your eye into a lovely um, focal point. So, I'm going to put that there. Maybe I'll use it. Maybe I won't. I want to talk about the colours because uh, the colours that we use today are going to be important, particularly because we're talking about aerial perspective. And when it comes to aerial perspective and the colours that you use, you need to be thinking about opposites, complementary colours on the colour wheel. I've got out one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is very unusual for me, but I've got specific colours for quite specific reasons because we're focusing on aerial perspective. I'm doing this as though I'm automatically creating depth in my painting. I have quinacridone magenta. If you watch the video I put out this morning, it is all about my uh, new palette set up. It's a Stephen Quiller palette. I'll just take that lid off for a second. And the video is all about how I'm moving to more transparent colours on my palette. And if you're into transparent colours, the quinacridone, so that is quinacridone magenta, which lives permanently on my palette. It's so beautifully transparent. All the quinacridones are beautifully transparent, as are the thalos. Lena says, what is um, reflective paint? Yes, you've answered your own question. Yes, yes, metallic, exactly. And um, so it's a, a really cheap version of metallic watercolour paints. You could add any sort of metallic paint and it just does that beautiful little reflective. Now, I bought a tube of permanent violet because I don't have a purple that lives permanently. Look, this beautiful spot here on my palette. I thought I might play with that uh, today and see if I love permanent violet. This is ultramarine blue, uh, which again lives permanently on my palette. And I have two blues, so I've got cobalt blue. Now, bringing back my painting... One second, here. Oh, Helen says, I did. Great info. Thanks, Helen. That's awesome. So thinking about the uh, blues, this blue has um, a little bit of texture. That might be related to the fact that it was a uh, piece of ash rough paper. So there's a little bit of texture. And I love rough paper for exactly that reason. But I'm going to be using... In terms of the blues, I'm going to be using cobalt blue for my sky for two reasons. It's not as dark as ultramarine blue. 
also it ultramarine blue tends to granulate. I don't want texture in my sky. I don't want more texture than the uh, than the paper might create in the sky. So cobalt blue, it's beautifully transparent. It's easy to work with, lovely to place off in the background. And uh, the ultramarine blue I'll be using when I mix up some beautiful colour for these trees because I do want them to uh, granulate. Okay, just move my painting again so we can continue talking about colour. And... I've been in love with phthalo blue turquoise. That's my new green. And anything that has phthalo in it, beautifully transparent. Uh, quinacridone, so I've got another quinacridone. And so that lives permanently on my palette. Oh, there. <laughs> that little knobby there is for orange because see how it's perfectly opposite the blue. And quinacridone gold. I hope I said the right um, name there, Conacridone Gold. I've also got Burnt Sienna for, a, again, a very specific purpose, that one. So when it comes to, oh, may, there'll probably be some Cobalt Blue. Let's use this as well. Cobalt Blue, this is the Quiller Wheel. In, it comes in the book if you buy the uh, book by Stephen Quiller. Cobalt Blue sits there. Ultramarine Blue sits there. So it's got a little bit of red in it, and Cobalt is a pure blue. There's nothing else in it. This is Burnt Sienna, fabulous landscape colour. If you're painting a landscape, uh, Burnt Sienna is absolutely brilliant. And an alternative, by the way, to Quinacridone Gold, if you don't have that, will be Raw Sienna. And you can get Raw Sienna, real raw sienna that are beautifully uh, transparent. Another alternative to Quinacridone Gold, uh, Raw Sienna, Yellow Ochre, all of those would work. Burnt Sienna, um, I find Burnt Umber does a similar look, but I love the redness of um, uh, the <laughs> Burnt Sienna. Um, yeah, so, okay, going back to my point, which is that these blues are beautifully opposite. The true complement to the blues is orange. And I don't tend to paint with orange, but that would work beautifully. And the burnt sienna sits on the inside of the colour wheel. It's a brown, so, you know, add three colours together, you get a brown. And that's a very specific brown because it's a ready brown. And it sits opposite these two. So when we come to the um, painting and we want to grey down our blue, which we need to grey down our blues in order to push them back, in order to desaturate them, the most beautiful thing you can do is add its complement. Um, if you didn't have that piece of information, you might be thinking, oh, well, I, I might add a little bit of Payne's Grey. That will work. I'm not into Payne's Grey. I like to make my own greys, and that's what we'll be doing by adding Burnt Sienna and either of those two blues. Anything that's opposite each other makes a complementary grey, and they are just so important in your um, paintings. Right, get rid of that one. I'm going to squeeze these out in a moment, spritz my palette, and then we can talk a little bit more as about what we're going to be painting. Uh, this is this rough version of the Academy, which is the student version of Baohong, and it's a block. Because I've been um, having lots of little tiny getaways, I've been using blocks more and more and more. Then you don't need a board, so you, hopefully you can see how it's gummed on all four sides, been enjoying that. The other painting that I'm going to do is on a beautiful, oops, upside down, is on a beautiful piece of Bao Hong. So they're both Bao Hong. This is the professional grade and this, I'll just show you the cover once more, is the, it's called the academy grade. So that's the student grade and that's the professional grade. And I love this student grade. Um, I paint massively on it. And then every now and again, I, if the, um, I want a super beautiful result or I want a super extra uh, bit of texture, then I will go for this beautiful um, Bao Hong professional grade. It's the master's choice. And again, it's rough because I just love the papers with rough. You could use any um, paper that you want. Okay, I'm going to come back to those in a moment. Uh, that's just my pad so I can write stuff down. 
when I'm demonstrating stuff. I've got a couple of books, as always. I'm going to get rid of the one perspective painting. So that was a vote for yes on the perspective painting as well as um, one vote on the positive and negative space. Thank you, Lena. <laughs> um, right. I've referred to this book a few times while we've been going through this wonderful series of the seven elements of art. It's a drawing book. It's not a watercolour book. But if you're after something that's about um, the basics, a, a drawing book is surprisingly good. I particularly liked this little section here, not that it has a bit on aerial perspective, it, funnily enough, it doesn't, but a lot of drawing books will cover uh, perspective in terms of those two aerial and linear perspective. Anyway, going back to this thing here, I wanted to keep in mind, I'm just going to jump straight in now to our um, section where, getting a pen, where we think about um, composing. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm going to squeeze out the colours. That's what I said I would do. Quinacridone gold. Oh, the other thing that will work beautifully. I'm going to be really generous with that one because I'm using it all the time. The other thing about uh, Lunar Earth. Lunar Earth sits permanently on my palette, but on the outside. This Quilla wheel comes with two outside sections, and I've got those two browns. But I'm not going to be using Lunar Earth today because... Uh, that's all I've got is that little tiny bit there. I need to get more. This is Burnt Sienna. It lives also permanently on my wheel, but it's a brown, so it doesn't get to sit on any of the special spots. There's Burnt Sienna. Here's Thalo Turquoise, Thalo Blue Turquoise. Um, the true green that Quilla recommends is... Uh, Oh, I can see that. It's a bluer. doesn't matter. Um, the true green that Quilla recommends is Viridian, but I've kind of stopped using Viridian because they all went lumpy, so I don't care. And also, oh, some of the Viridians weren't transparent, and I'm totally going into the transparent thing. This is Sennelier, Ultramarine Deep. This is where Ultramarine lives. Look how much I've got there. Fabulous. Squeeze out fresh stuff anyway. And here's cobalt. Can't believe I'm getting near the end of this wonderful tube of cobalt blue. Such a magical, beautiful colour. This is permanent violet. It's a whole bone colour. I thought I might give it a burl. See if I like it. Put some over there. See if um, usually I just mix my own purples, but... You know how you're online shopping and sometimes <laughs> you're like, oh, wow, I would like to try that product. And it says, you might also like, and I'm like, cool, I might. This is quinacridone magenta and it's in its little special place there. I'm going to now spritz my palette just to get those colours wet. And I just spritz the whole thing. Because if I change my mind and I'd like some other colour there, I've uh, wetted it just that little bit and it can sit over there. Okay, let's think about composition from the drawing book, particularly because I'm going to put uh, that image there. Just grab my lid so I can place it there because that's where the camera is showing at the moment. I'm going to be painting in a landscape direction. Is that clear enough? Uh, hey, good morning, Julie. And Helen says, so exciting, putting first colour on my new palette. Oh, so exciting, Helen. So understand the excitement there. Okay. Thinking about our um, landscape, your first thought could be, this is where I like to start, where do I want my horizon line? Do I want a high horizon line? Do I want a low horizon line? Mostly I want to be thinking about not that. So you'd never want to do a 50-50. Uh, it kind of breaks it up 
into that top half and bottom half and it, it's less cohesive. So a high one, a low one, you place the horizon line wherever you want to. Uh, now, uh, going back, right, so I wanted to talk about this. Um, this has got this beautiful example here of different types of tree trunks. Definitely need to zoom in for that one. Not that we closer. There. Okay. That's better, isn't it? <laughs> that way. That way. Just placing it better. So you can see there. Excellent. Composing landscapes. So he's got this beautiful example. Oh, I said he. What an assumption. Yep, Walter, I was right. I hate assuming men done everything. Um, he makes this point, if you just create all your tree trunks being uh, straight up and down, it's really boring. Or he says, too uniform. Uh, when you move one, however, it starts to get interesting. If you point them out on different angles, it's too um, odd. It's a, and it's very much like a pattern. And then if you point them in towards each other, it gives a feeling of unsteadiness. Uh, these are really um, <laughs> excellent points for us to be thinking about as we create our landscape. So this will be a horizon line that's barely seen on our painting. And uh, so my first thought is that, uh, oh, I've got this beautiful Y-shaped tree. Perhaps that one could be here and go up and up. And that's a thinner one. I'm gonna color it in because they will be dark in my painting. Uh, the Y is above my one third. You can play with that. And it's pretty straight. So I want to create a little more interest with the next one. Perhaps the next one could be coming off the side and then go straight. And that way we get a little bit of leaning in and then, um, um, oh, that's nice, I think. But, and that negative space is a little bit different to that negative space. And then do we put two trees over there or do we put in a little sapling here? A sapling could be good, but it also might be a little confusing because generally with um, shapes, you um, and aerial perspective, you want to be thinking about in the background, small shapes, and then in the foreground, big shapes. And that's one of the many ways that artists create um, perspective in painting. Big objects close, visual objects off in the distance. So we're going to be doing a bit of that. And that's why this sapling here might be something that I might um, avoid. Okay, let's go to the next one. I'm going to do the same thing. The horizon line is going to be high in my painting. And I don't want to repeat what I've already done. So I kind of like this Y over there. I kind of liked that one actually. Right, let's start there. Where, what we're deciding is where are the tree trunks going to go? And right, so up like that. And perhaps the split could come a little lower and bring it in like that. Worth having an image. Um, sometimes to, mm, no, go like that. Sorry, worth having an image to copy from. It's amazing what you think about when you do it. I'm just changing that a little bit to make it a little more satisfying. And I've got, particularly noticing here, because we're talking about space, these negative spaces are all different and that is so interesting in a painting. Okay, so I've got a big one over there and I'm only thinking about my big ones at the moment. The, the distant ones are going to be small and soft. They'll be much easier to put in. Um, right, in the foreground, I don't want one that matches it um, because this tilts in. I don't want one that matches it like that. Symmetry in the painting needs to, um, 
go out because symmetry is about pattern. So if that goes in, I don't want to make it also go out because it'll go out of the painting. So I'm thinking it'll come gently in and then go straight. How's that? Like that. I'm just inventing little um, tree trunks, uh, branches. So I've got one, two. This one could be fatter, it could be thinner, you can decide. And then will there be one over here? Uh, so this one can be straight because they're tilting. This one can be straight. All tree trunks get thinner, so that needs to be fatter at the bottom. That's a pretty good rule. Of course, you, <laughs> as Australians, we're really um, familiar with the Boab tree, which is hilariously upside down in terms of uh, its shape. Um, right, so this one, will I make it go that way or lean away? I've got this beautiful space here. I'm loving that. And I'm just going to generally draw it in and... Right, so with that and that are at the same space position, so don't want to repeat that. That one, this one should start lower. I'm just making lots of decisions based on not repeating something. So that is straight and then I might give it a tilt that way. Not bad. Good place to start. I love the three, so one, two, three really common for me to do the um, threes as uh, a foreground focus and uh, make it interesting. Uh, Viv says lots of decisions to make. Yeah, there are, there are. Hopefully, uh, if you're following along with your doing your thumbnail, you're thinking, I like the threes or I like fives or I like odd numbers. Um, I'm not going to bother doing too much planning about the distant trees because they will be soft and easy and to take you through that process. Helen says, do you need to avoid or deliberately have some in corners? Oh, yeah, excellent question. Do you like that look? Um, sometimes you can take the viewer off the page, but I'm hoping in this example I'm leading you in the page. And so for that point, I will be thinking about ways to lead you up when I paint the tree. Um, good question, Helen. Uh, ways to bring me in. And while I'm thinking of it, I'm just going to switch colours so I can talk about... Um, the other big thing, which is where's your light coming from? Very important because you want to be consistent. If it's coming from this way, this side of the trees will generally be darker, 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 like that. And then you get a, a nice consistency uh, to it. But in terms of avoiding the corner, no, this, I have seen lots of rules about um, do it and then lots of rules about don't and I think the thumbnails where you sit and play with that idea I did do it both times but so I find that one quite nice too I think that as long as you think about things like leading in I think corners make things quite interesting rather than um, keeping it within the frame this is this is uh, this idea that it touches the edges is I find very important I'm just going to go back to my painting that we're going to be focusing on and thinking about did I? I tended to add some darks there and some darks there and some darks there. Yes, yeah, so you can particularly see it with this one. I decided on a light source that was coming from over here and I'm generally light on that side and darker on that side. Generally lighter and a little bit darker. Generally lighter and a little bit darker. I didn't go over the top there. Uh, and I might do a little bit more about that in this one. Okay, so we've got our colours. Hopefully you've got a reference or you'll just make it up a little bit. 
um, which is never a problem. I mean, that's kind of cool. Get rid of that one. And so I talked about the making it interesting but not look like it's unsteady. Of course, if you do want it to look like it's unsteady, it, then here's the answer to making it look uh, more unsteady um, and too much opposition. If you find that you've got a central one and, and two, it's a little bit like a crown. It's very patinated and you don't want pattern because trees never appear uh, as patterns. Okay, I can get rid of that book. I did have this other book. So moving that one over. This book is called This. I love this book. I come back to it, I reckon, every six months. 200 Projects to Strengthen Your Art Skills. This one's by Valerie Valerie um, Colston, I should do a review. Uh, I'll do a little video on this book because um, it's absolutely brilliant for all aspects of art. So uh, this section on perspective covers these two sections that we've been talking about today, um, aerial perspective and linear perspective. And then they've got this example here about one-point perspective, two-point perspective, three-point perspective. Um, great thing to learn in terms of drawing. Um, and when it comes to the three-point perspective, once you've gotten two-point perspective, three-point perspective, is it's not that much more of a uh, leap. But I did find a leap in my learning when I went from one to two um, because the uh, I never went to traditional art school. I did a master's instead and when you do a master's you get there and they're like, hey, you know everything so uh, you just jump in and go off and uh, make art by yourself. They don't give you any training if you do a master's. And so that meant um, I had to uh, go back to the books every time I needed to work stuff out. So aerial perspective. Um, so they've got a little comment here about texture. So the trees in this foreground here have texture on them. I'm going to zoom into that because this is going to be beautifully relevant to what we're doing now. Is that take us in further, take us out? And what does that one do? Take us out. Oh, that's not it. Take us back in. Uh, I've got all these options on my little camera, you see. Oh, lovely. There. Just put it. Oh, look, it's even focused. Beautiful. So uh, he makes this point. She makes this point that uh, these trunks here in the foreground, you can see the bark. These mid-ground trees, you can barely see the bark. And, of course, as it goes further away, there's no texture. So texture in the foreground, less texture, no texture. And then um, this is a nice example of uh, using some darks in the foreground. Actually, this combines both, a bit of linear perspective and aerial perspective because it's got these trees leading off to uh, nowhere. If you've got photos of um, vineyards, that is such a brilliant uh, thing to practice because it's all, if you sit at a certain point, the vineyards, um, all the ways that they've painted all the uh, grape bushes, grape trees, grape vines are in rows. And so at any different point, you, you get linear perspective. Uh, right, so the artist uses colour to express distance. So there's all these bright greens and there's some lovely darks. And then as you go off, the greens, so particularly like at this point, that is a greyed down green. And when I was talking earlier about colour theory, that might be green mixed with a bit of its complement, which would be a bit of red. And we're going to be doing a bit of that, um, not green with red so much today, but blue with burnt sienna or blue with orange if you have orange. Jane says, did you deliberately start tree branches at the horizon line? Ooh. <laughs> this is the one that I was thinking about. No, it wasn't deliberate. Thank you for pointing that out. And um, <laughs> that's funny. I think when I paint it, I'll probably, I'm adding the, a little bit of extreme purple, I'll probably change that a little bit and maybe there'll be one here or maybe this will have an extra branch that goes in and maybe goes up like that 
uh, I'll be thinking about making sure that they go at different um, levels. So that was a good uh, a good point. Helen says, I think we need to paint in the vineyard. Wouldn't that be cool? Go to the, one of those lovely vineyards and have a lovely lunch and then um, after lunch and a little bit of wine from the vineyard, paint the uh, trees. Right. So if you're interested in that book, it's called 200 Projects, Val Valerie Colston. Absolutely love this one. It's called, <laughs> look on the bottom, for aspiring art students. And it's, it is, it's uh, all, a, it's assuming no knowledge. I love that idea. Get rid of that book. We're ready to paint. Cool. Let's start with um, the beautiful stuff. Gets, no, no. Let's start with the slightly cheaper stuff. Let's go to the Academy block. Zoom out again so you can see what I'm doing. Take the lid off my palette. And it's been um, spritzed. And um, so I, I did have in mind to paint two paintings, one with the distant mountains and one with the trees. But I've been yammering on doing all the explaining and I think I need to simplify and do, um, we could still do two, two paintings, uh, but I think we'll go straight in for the trees. Right, okay. Now. I'm going to go with this design. Uh, not possible to put it there. <laughs> I'm going to put an imaginary line here. It's just in my mind. And uh, that's where I'm going to be thinking about a sky. I'm going to put in a beautiful wet background. Just move this over a little bit and make sure there's some lovely cobalt at this level. And I'm going to let the paint run all over the place because I love that look. And then I'll switch to the other painting and I think we'll do two paintings. I love to work that way. I find if I, um, I'm just going to get a big brush. This is my new Harker one. I talked about this last week that it shed on the first week and not on the second week. I'm just watering that up beautifully. And let's get some paint. Oops. Uh, I'm going to for my zero black gold. Oh, I've got a bigger one. I've got a two. This is a size two black gold. Oh, that's a better idea. Go a bit bigger. I've also got a fabulous mop brush. This um, I never use for detail mop brushes. I'd love these for the detail because of that point. But this one will be wonderful um, for putting on lots of lovely colour. Uh, that one, that one. Let's get some. I'll use my number two black gold. Okay, there we go. Lovely blue. Just cobalt blue at this stage. And um, it's going to be quite a plain sky. And then I'll put a bit of blue down here. But at the same time, it's a nice opportunity to put in a little bit of uh, texture down the bottom. So for that texture, I'm going to get another brush. And I'm going to grab some of that quinacridone gold and mix up some of that. Not that it's textured. But it is warm. That's, that's the other theory that we haven't talked about is the theory about cool colours recede and warm colours um, come forward. But I have kind of barely think about that one um, anymore because there's so many times when it doesn't seem to uh, work in the way that you're expecting it to. Now, if I was taking my time, I would put a bit of salt in the foreground, but we'd have to wait for that to dry. So let's um, create our own texture in a different way. Right. I've got a blue and the quinacridone gold. Stack of water. Stack of water. If you love, I'm going to move this over because I'm going to be creating a little space here so I can tip off my excess water. Stack of water. You could do a controlled amount of water, but I find if you put on a stack of water, it's a lot faster. Okay, just get rid of the excess quickly. Tip it onto my towel. 
And let's get this blue slightly darker at the top. So the sky above you is closer, so it'll be darker and darker, darker, darker. And then I'm going to wash that off and just go lighter. So this represents the sky above your head. And then I'm going lighter, lighter, lighter. Look at it moving in. Oh, whoopsie. Camera goes out of focus. Um, right, and then I'm going to add a little bit down there for the fun of it. And no, nah, not for the fun of it, because I like to use the colours in other places in my painting. There. And some quinacridone gold in my foreground. Nice bit of warmth and a little opportunity to add some in. So I can't resist putting a little bit in the middle ground. And again, I'm going to tip that off. I want to get rid of all the excess. Um, moisture. All the excess moisture. I'll tip it the other way as well. Rotate and tip completely off. I'm touching the towel. So I'm rotating it right over. Um, so that's like flat. So that's 180 degrees. And then you lift it to 90. That's 90 degrees. I'm going past 90 degrees. What's that? 120? I don't know. Oh, I accidentally touched my palette. So I'm going to turn it around and see if I need to um, correct that. Okay, how's that? Yes, okay. So this is just moved ever so gently and I've got a slightly darker blue. We all know it dries 10 to 15% lighter and then it's coming down to nothing and then I've got some lovely colours in the foreground. So this is where I've accidentally touched my palette. So I'm just going to get a tissue because I don't want to put on more water. We want to get painting and I'm just going to run it in a landscape direction. And, oh, I can't resist putting in something in the sky there. Okay, that'll do. Now I'm going to let that dry on an angle like that and uh, just put it down next to me. But I want it on this angle because I hopefully have done my sky and I'm not going to touch it again. And any excess moisture or moving paint is going to come in this direction. And I quite like that because uh, can you see that moving down already? The paint is moving through the blue and um, starting to create some lovely um, magic mixing of quinacridone gold and uh, cobalt. Right, so I'm just going to set this aside on a lovely angle. Painting number two coming up. So I'm going to be doing the same thing. I'm just going to clean my palette. I don't want it to be wet as I put down this beautiful piece of paper. Lovely piece of paper. There is an upside and a, a backside and when you get it out of the packet, the surface that's painting upwards, that's facing upwards, is going to be the upside. Now, having said that, it's a beautiful piece of paper. I will be able to paint on the back, but there's, it's probably hard for you to see, but there's less texture on the back. All right. Asking tape. Need to zoom out a little further so you can see all of that. Right. Please do let me know if my camera goes out of focus. I get so <laughs> into the process that uh, I regularly forget to look up and see what your viewpoint is. Okay. I'm just using up this blue. I don't use it on purpose, but boy, I do like to use stuff up. I find it satisfying to use up your stash of stuff. Yeah. 
also, it does make it a little easier for you to see the borders of my um, painting. The other reason I don't really like this blue is that it's not at all transparent. So making an even um, border on the painting is um, uh, harder to do. Anyway, I'm not going to be using more of this cobalt, but what I... Um, but I'm not going to get rid of it because it's, you know, we're going to be using uh, ultramarine. So it's, you know, it'll just dominate it and it won't mean a thing. Now, can you see on my palette that the quinacridone gold is um, traveling into my cobalt? This um, big table that I have, it's this big recycled old thing and <laughs> it's um, decided to slowly move in some direction. Uh, and so that is a result of my palette being a little uneven. So it's completely beautiful, but it's very, it's a little bit annoying. And I didn't especially want them to mix at this stage. Look at that green that it makes. Excellent um, sign. Okay, we're going to repeat the process. You could change it on um, this one if you want to, but I'm going to keep the elements quite similar in that lovely big background on the um, for the sky. Oh, I said we weren't going to use the cobalt, but I just realized that we've got another sky to paint. So use the same colors, more cobalt, get rid of that because I'm not using it yet, and more quinacridone gold. Oh, I know. Let's whip out some of this um, Burnt sienna. <laughs> Apologies for the uh, break in um, my <laughs> speaking then. Uh, right, same process. Lot of water. Lot of water, lot of water, lot of water. And that is faster. And I just love watching the whole thing move about. I'm going to have to make space here so I can tip off. The excess, making space. Okay, get rid of the excess. Right. There. And similar method, lovely background and slightly darker at the top. And then it comes down to nothing. I'm going to add more, add more, add more. I might go in again and get some more slightly thicker paint. And put in a bit up there, there. A bit of randomness there. A bit of water. Bring it down. And um, I do want it to travel down, but I want that blue to remain up there. Uh, I'm going to tip it in a couple of directions. And again, I've got... Uh, in the other one, I used quinacridone gold, but this time I'm going to come in with my burnt sienna. And um, now I'm thinking about it, the burnt sienna uh, granulates a little bit, so that's perfect for the, oops, oh, yeah, no, it's all right. I was putting in blue, 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 and more burnt sienna, and I want it. It was doing such beautiful things as it moved on that angle. I'm going to tip it that way first. Just look at those gentle little beautiful things that uh, Helen says, I forgot to get rid of excess water before painting, so I have blooms everywhere. I, in this one, I wouldn't worry about that. And a lot of the time I'd be, you know, if you're after a perfect sky, then... Um, then you might want to consider starting again. But in this example, we've got all these beautiful trees to put in the foreground. So I um, don't think we should worry at all. So uh, again, I've got the angle going so that the colours come down and they're moving into each other and creating beautiful um, textural marks that are coming down in this direction. I am loving that one. Just blotting up excess water and that's dried off so that we can put trees in. I particularly want the sky dry. So I'm going to focus up there first. 
and I want any of that action to go in that direction. I just love these uh, little bits and pieces. Oh, thank you to those who've given me a thumbs up. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you turning up and I appreciate you commenting. It makes a world of difference. Part of the my motivation in doing YouTube Live, I'm getting rid of that excess moisture, in doing YouTube Live is that you can ask questions. And I'm not doing much face-to-face -face teaching these days, so um, I just love the interaction, though. So you asking questions and saying stuff is so cool. And the thumbs up is um, it totally... I find it really, really encouraging. Get rid of that. Don't want to put the heat on my tape because um, I'm sure you're all aware that it releases the gum. It's a way of getting tape off your paper. Okay. That is half dry. And I've got the other one to dry off. So I'm going to see, just gather up those excess bits. I'm going to actually touch it because it doesn't matter if I create a bit of texture down there at all. Okay, I'm going to get rid of that one. And come back to the other one on the block. Big drippy drips down here. So I'm just going to, oh, lovely little bit down there. I'm just going to mop so it doesn't do something it, I don't want it to do. And, yeah, it's swollen and very damp. So I'm going to dry this one. And, again, it's particularly about the sky. We want that sky. This is the other advantage to a block if you're using a heat gun or a hairdryer to speed up the drying process. The heat gun, uh, the block, sorry, uh, is not, I'm, I haven't got any masking tape to affect. Right, starting on the sky because that's most important. And just... A quick little dry down there. It doesn't have to be bone dry in the foreground. For now, it doesn't matter that much about what's going on there because we're about to put in some lovely trees at this level. A bit drier there. Okay. Just um, untangling things over there. Okay. Now. Oh. Okay, I'm getting organized, sitting down. We're going to be putting in some background trees. So bring this one back. We've got this general uh, plan here, or hopefully you've all done uh, thumbnails. And if you haven't, don't worry about it, because just paint intuitively. Put the trees wherever you feel like it. I really don't mind. Helen says, seeing you have 20% off blocks and pads. Thanks. Helen, that's fantastic. Senior Art is a um, um, website based in Melbourne, Australia, and um, they are brilliant to deal with. I have um, nothing but praise for them. Great website, regular specials. You just subscribe to it. Thanks, Helen. And now we're dealing with these little background trees. We're going to have a space here, so I want to be thinking um, about adding little marks at this point at just as I'm going along. And um, I'm thinking that the horizon line is at, is at about this point. So will there be some trees behind the horizon? I don't care. I'm mostly going to be focusing on the big trees in the foreground. I want to put in some lovely distant trees. So thinking about aerial perspective, we're thinking about um, the spaces, the negative spaces versus the positive spaces. So this beautiful negative space and how irregular it is and how different it is to that one, to that one, to that one. Um, so this is going to, in fact, be this side. And then I've got two trees to go over here. So um, 
these trees that will be appearing up here, I will see. I, I don't think it matters that much how many you put in the background. I think what's important is that you think about aerial perspective in terms of colour. You want, <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> I'm so sorry, I've been uh, avoiding coughing up until now. One second while I have a drink. I'm going to put in some lovely trees. What I don't want is patterns. I don't want to be repeating stuff. Uh, the So two things about the colours of those trees. They're going to be pale in tone, plus they're going to be desaturated. And that's what we were talking about at the beginning is the um, using opposites and the um <laughs> using complementary colours to create opposites. So there's my cobalt and um, I'm going to add a little bit of ultramarine, just change the blue uh, from the blue from the sky. I'm going to get out some burnt sienna and over here, so I'll leave some of that blue to use, but over here, love all this space on this palette. Over here, I'm going to desaturate my blue. So see that beautiful gray? That's blue and uh, burnt sienna together. You could do blue and uh, quinacridone gold as, as well. And instant gray. Uh, and that's why I don't buy paint gray. I like making my own. Grays. I love that little piece of um, use of uh, colors, not introduce another color, but use your colors to create something lovely. Now, this needs to be more watery. Remember the part about low value plus desaturated color. Now, these are going to be some lovely um, trees. So I'm going to paint them in water. Apologies for the fact that it's going to be hard to see. If I go in closer, will that help? If I go in closer again, yeah, you can just see that little tree over there, a little tree, and um, <laughs> I'm going to put in a bit of colour on that tree. And on the bottom of that tree, I'm going to take it off to nothing. And it's a bit fatter at the top than the bottom, so I'm just going to make the bottom uh, fatter. Now, I need to be keeping in mind at all times this direction. So this side will have more tone. And it can have a little branch and maybe a little branchy bit goes off like that. And again, soft, soft, soft. No details at this point, but I am giving it a little bit of form. Okay, next one, another tree. I'll do one close by. Uh, just pull it down a bit. That'll be better, won't it? There. Okay, another one here. It can be thinner. <clears throat> I'm having trouble <laughs> with that one. Grey, another grey one. Put the lovely soft marks in and it can have a branch and it can have a branch that does that. Maybe it goes like that and maybe that goes over like that. I'm just playing with it. And then a bit of tone mostly on this side. And I'm going to repeat that all the way across. This is just water. So I'm going to get rid of the detail on the bottom of that tree. More water. I'm going to go to this side now. Actually, I'm going to soften that branch off and soften that branch. Don't want details to jump out from the distance. Here's another tree. Let's let's go for a little tiny one up there and a little tiny one there. Little tiny ones. Here's my grey. Give them a little bit of colour. I don't know whether they'll be covered at this point. Um, I never go into that level of detail of planning. And, but you could, if you love the thumbnail planning stage, I listen to people on YouTube all the time talking about the success of the painting is in the planning stage. And uh, I'm a bit like, ugh, life's too short for me to spend that much time in the 
planning stage. I prefer the serendipity of, oh, did it work? And I'm totally <laughs> aware that that goes against the grain. Maybe if I'd gone to a traditional art school, <laughs> I might I'll put a little tiny one up there, little tiny, and maybe one that crosses it like that. Okay, little bit of water. And this one has the paint, 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 paint. Soft, give it a little branch. Oh, this one can come from right off the edge there. Now oh, that's nice. And maybe it's got um, a branch. Again, I'm going to soften off the base of this tree, made it a little fatter. That was too fat, but that might be the sort of thing I cover um, and cover later with um, something. Okay, a little bit of tone on this side. A little bit of tone on this side, tone over here, tone, 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 little touches. So it's pale and desaturated. So I, my plan, I've splattered here without meaning to. Oh, what a great thought. I think I will put in a little bit of splatter down here. Just while I've remembered. And here, now I don't want those details up there. Here's my big mop brush, just full of water. I'm going to wash them off. And I don't really want much detail there either. I just want it in this center. I've got this kind of triangular shape here. So I've got some lovely. Um, bit of texture here. So thinking about my plan, it's going to come in like that. I've, that's why I've added little dotty textures in this centre here. And I also want to think about how I'd like there to be a tree in this distance, I'll move it down a little bit, at this distant point so that this will come in and then I'd like a tree over there. Now, Back to my same method, I'll put in a little bit of water. Well, there's a lot of water there, doesn't matter. A little bit of water, I want, um, let's do three trees. So I've just gone in for a little bit of water, just drop in the colour. That's got a little bit of green in it. So it's picked up some of, oh, look, the oh, <laughs> you can't see that, sorry. The um, Cronacridone Gold has decided to travel right into my grey. So I am going to go with it. I've got a greeny. It's kind of nice. It's a little bit different to the others. They can be smaller and again it's desaturated and the, the tone is pale. That's the most important part that the tone is pale even if you don't want to desaturate. Okay make the trunk base, the roots that is, go off to nothing Get rid of any hard lines that you wouldn't really see in, in a series of trees that are off in the distance like that. Perhaps some with my watery brush, I'm going to add a little bit of interest over here because my um, design kind of points that way. So that green, I'm liking that green. It's a desaturated green. I'm going to put in a little bit more and, and that for me is what watercolour, that's, that's where it's so enjoyable. I'm just totally going with the flow there. Um, these look a little bit odd or do they look a bit interesting? They're irregular. I've got lovely negative spaces and it's nice to take a moment right now and go, are there any spaces I need to change? There's a lump there. I need to change that one, change, get rid of that. Um, yeah, it's good. So it kind of stops there. Let's take it out a little bit and over there. Let's put a bit more of this green that goes over. So perhaps it goes. And um, I think I'm kind of creating a... a Get rid of that and that. I'm kind of creating a horizon line. I am soft, 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 soft. Get rid of that. 
I'm using the brush and pushing it up. I'm going to need something at this level as well, but I need them to dry. Let's repeat that on the other one while this dries. So again, I'm going to, I'll just zoom out so you can see a little more. I'm going to put it on an angle like that. So if anything is moving, see like this big, beautiful um, drip here, I'm going to blow it. Can you just see that there? Not really. There's another big drip there. I'm just blowing them uh, down. There's a drip there. I'm just blowing it, blowing it. Oh, and there's a lovely drip there. Oh, that's better. See how it's creating these abstract marks. I'm going to force this. I'm going to grab some of that. Oh, that's beautiful. Grab some. I'm doing a little bit of burnt sienna. Totally not what I've been <laughs> talking about. But this is a bit of a focal area, so I'm going to do it. And then I am just spraying that, uh, spraying. I'm blowing it. Oh, there's another drip there. And I've just blown it so that it's right down there. I'm going to make them a bit softer. That one didn't blow. Perhaps it could blow in that direction or that direction. I'm going to have this triangle. Oh, ah, it's going to go that way. Okay, I think I shall put in some of the beautiful green like that and then I'm going to blow it. And I thought quite carefully about which direction I want it to go in that um, way. It's not moving. More paint. It's very wet just there, so that's why it's not really. Okay, I'm going to blow that again. You can buy little blowing tools, you know. Oh, now that's lovely. Look how I've got all these complex little bits there. And that's, I'm going to, this will be my focal point. So uh, that's great. Maybe I could add a bit more there. Or actually, I'll add it there. Um, I've been holding it on an angle the whole time. Oh, okay. Where's my, okay, I'm going to do burnt sienna. Mix it in with this gray mix. Just put some here. So it's moving upwards. Moving up. I'll put a bit there too. And then I'm going to blow it so it comes down. It's probably going to go into that bit, but I'm okay with that. Here goes. <laughs> I blew pretty hard. <laughs> Nothing happened. More paint. Touch, touch, touch with the tip of my brush. Tip, tip, tip. Try again. <laughs> God, I hope I'm not boring you by sitting here and blowing stuff. Ah, oh, that's worth it. And look, it tipped into this bit here. That's just beautiful. Now, the other thing that I haven't been thinking about is the direction. So thinking about this one, big arrow coming in this direction. I am happy with this tone, this tone. That has no tone, but they are really off in the distance. That has little bits of tone. And um, I've lost my grey, so all I need to do is grab more ultramarine and I mix it into this lovely greeny greyish mix. Um, I'm going to put some here and there and maybe over here. Oh, I am so enjoying um, just those beautiful wet in wet. Okay, put it over here. Um, only because it's my focal point and I know that it's a bit dark. So if you want to stick to more accurately to the theory of no darks in the background, don't add the darks there. But this is my focal point, so I'm, I'm loving this idea. Okay, I have to stop fiddling with all of that because we've got the other painting and the, uh, the absolute beauty right now. Oh, by the way, I'm going to just let it dry on this angle in case anything's going to move. Actually, there's very little, but it doesn't matter. Still, it's a good uh, theory. Okay, swap paintings. Back to this one on the beautiful paper. And we're going to do the same thing. And um, 
it is such a beautiful exercise to be painting the same subject um, twice. And you're going to give yourself all these options of ways to go. And more importantly, one of the reasons why I do it is to avoid disappointment. Um, so many of us watercolorists are perfectionists. And for years, I would just have some wonderful idea in mind and then I would get all disappointed because it didn't turn out. So I nearly always paint in multiples and that way my mind is switching from one to the other and I'm not thinking about, oh, is that going to turn out? I'm not putting pressure on myself. Quite the opposite. I'm just loving the fact that I'm enjoying the painting process. So let's get into some distant trees and I've been putting them in with... I've got uh, lots of that beautiful grey there, but I need it. And I'm going to just clear a little spot down here for my water brush. And that can sit there then. And then this grey is very green. So to get around that, add blue. It's a nice rule of thumb in colour mixing is add blue if you're not sure. Okay, camera. That's better. A bit of that. Now add a bit of a bit more burnt sienna and it goes to the grey side. Instant desaturation by adding its complement. I could do a lot of exercises just on complements. Now uh, on the other one I started on that side. So I'm going to reverse my um, method. I'm going to go on this side. Let's have one that... Um, comes, oh, I'm going to have it on the edge. As soon as I put that water on, I'm going to put in tone just on the right-hand side. Okay. So we've done this a couple of times now, so we will automatically get faster. More water and tone just on that side and more water. Um, that one, that one, I'm going to make that tree trunk a bit different that one can come down to there water off the bottom it needs to be fatter at the bottom than the top so I'm going to extend the base like that and again soften soften we want light tones up here let's give that a branch and I'm just this time adding tone to one side of it. Just soften that off as well. Soften, soften, and more water. Um, this one, I'm going to do the same pattern because um, uh, that will save time in thinking. <laughs> and I so appreciate that you're all here and I want to get these done. Uh, water and let's do two trees thin and thick and a wonky one gray and just into the water if you look on the side it's much easier to see where the um, paint goes and you can see me getting faster and faster because I'm starting to get the hang of what I'm doing and I'm just going to put in a lovely tree trunk oh I should switch brushes for that one bit of water water anything you don't love just soften it off and maybe it'll look like something later soften off all of this space down here and this space soften um I've got quite hard edges there I'm going to soften that too soften soften and maybe that can soften down to there and there. I'm bringing it down to nearly the 50% mark. So I need to, in this next little batch over here, be thinking smaller. I think that um, I was getting bigger because I'm thinking less uh, about it. <laughs> okay, let's put in a little copse of trees. I got that uh, word copse from a um, video on oh, there's this British guy and he's got the most wonderful voice and he paints all these British landscapes and he's the one that says a copse of trees 
His accent is divine. Uh, when I find him later, I'll add it to um, the info about this uh, um, the info on this. <laughs> uh, I was focusing there. That's good. A bit of up and down movement there, hey? And let's uh, blow that one. No, right, get rid of that and that. Uh, blowing time. Bit of an angle and... <laughs> all right, I've blown all over the place. Wow. Just said that out loud, didn't I? Far out. Okay, bringing my finger in to just increase the randomness of those things. That dark one there is too dark for my liking. Um, I can make it darker later once I've got a bit of a focal point. Thinking about those negative spaces because this is all about space. Um, and thinking about contrast as well. At this level, for things that are off in the distance, low contrast, which means low tones or light tones next to other light tones. And we've desaturated the colour and we're putting in almost no texture. Now, I'm just wondering what to do with my brush in while it's in that wet state. It's so lovely to do that. I blew that and it moved in that direction. So I'm just going to interrupt some of the pattern a little bit. Oh, push my brush up and give that a bit of interest. Does it look like a little copse of trees? Not really. They're a bit um, equidistant now. They're not equidistant, but there's something wrong with them. Um, I don't know. Can't work it out. At the moment, I'm just going to go into these trees here. So these ones are about that height. Those ones are about that height. So this next lot, I'm going to change, make sure it doesn't go any lower than that. And having said that out loud, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to put a pencil mark there. Remember, Marion, that is the lowest that you want them to be. Grab my water brush. And I had one on the edge there, so perhaps one starts at about here. And uh, it can be big, as in wide, but a bit wonky. All right. Is this? I'd be very interested to know whether or not you are all painting along. A couple of times people have said to me, no, I, I don't paint along. I watch and then I paint afterwards. I'd be interested to know whether or not most of you are painting along and um, or do most of you watch and, you know, do maybe some of the planning or um, water, 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 and I'm going no lower. Um, Lena says yes, but it's, it, is, it is fact. <laughs> I'm not sure what that word is meant to be. Yes, but it is fast. <laughs> ah, excellent. Yeah, that, that is a great way to do it, in fact, fast. Okay, I've got one tree that goes like that, some nice uprights. I think I need a tree that's falling backwards there. Fast is good. And um, fast is what I love to do. I love fast. I'm going to give this one a fat trunk, a fat branch that can come over and connect. You want these things to be connecting. That's that's pretty good. There, soft, soft. There, oh, lovely colour down here. And I'm going to take this as an opportunity to blow. I'm adding colour, colour, colour. Okay, blow. Well, that was cool. Look, it's even got an angle on it. Let's take it off to nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. That needs a little bit of something there, doesn't it? I think I'll go back into this brownie, grayish. They're all 
desaturated colours that I'm using at this um, point. Oh, they look nice and random. I'm going to blow that and then soften. <laughs> Didn't do a thing. <laughs> if I keep doing this, I'm going to give myself a headache. I'm going to drag it up. Helen says, painting along with you, but yours is interesting. Mine is <laughs> Uh, very funny. <clears throat> now, if there's anyone else here who knows Helen, she's really good. So her mess is going to be a, a lot like what I'd call a mess. Um, how are we going? Nice. I'm going to let that one dry and we can move to the other one. And you will be really surprised at how it's not going to take us that much longer. We are like 80% uh, done, believe it or not. The final bits here are not going to take us long at all. So um, I've got my image and I want to be thinking a little bit about this beautiful bark texture. I want to be thinking and I'm going to redo the arrow because once I get painting, I'm always wonderfully surprised and I don't mean wonderful um, in a good way. I'm big arrow so that I am, oops, you can't see that, big arrow. Remember, Marion, <laughs> light side, dark side. So the light is coming from this way, therefore on this side, dark. Oh, I'll do that as well on my little image. Oh, and Viv says she watches first. Interesting. Okay. Uh, now we get to put in the big trees. Back to my design. Okay, I had this one. I don't mind the simplicity of this, interestingly, and I definitely don't like that one anymore. I do quite like this, but there's something about that one I love, but it's only two trees, whereas this has got the three, and I know I'm going to love the idea of the three first. So perhaps I'll do this shape. I'll change that, and particularly because I really liked that someone um, asked that question, Jane asked the question about my branches being at the horizon line, and this one is a little bit lower. So I like the idea that I might bring that one a bit lower. And so is it dry enough for me to – yeah, it's a touch damp, but that'll be absolutely fine. So I'm going to keep that handy, and I've got my image handy as well. And um, I could uh, zoom out so that you could see the images at the same time, but I'm going to guess it's more important that you – oh, I know what I'll do. I'll put this under here. I've torn it off. There. That way you can see what I'm painting and hopefully you're thinking about your design as well. I'm going to paint the trees in – <clears throat> excuse me, a similar way, but I'm going to go to a much bigger brush. So I mentioned at this beginning this quill, not wonderful for detail at all, marvellous for big painting and um, lots of wet and wet and stuff like that. Um, in look, I absolutely love, I don't know why I do an American accent sometimes, too much American television. I'm in love with these beautiful um, strokes uh, that come down that uh, were all blown. Alrighty, I've got a tree and they're going to go over these trees here and I'm going to end up with a um, lovely uh, triangle and it's an offset triangle. So this section is bigger than this section and it's going to kind of do that. That will help me decide. This is where the tree is coming in and I'm going to go straight over this and um, it is a little bit damp though. I can't decide about whether or not I might dry it. Maybe it's a good thing that it's a little bit damp because I don't want those details to throw, show through on my um, tree. So, right, let's leave it damp. I'm just going to go for it. The tree starts, this one starts in a little bit. In this design, I had the tree coming from the corner. So I actually like it coming from here. Okay. Big water brush is ready to go. I need to change these colours. I don't want them so desaturated anymore. 
gum trees um, are beautifully gray. So I do like the idea of the gray, but it's going to have way more of my beautiful blue in it. So here I've got a real blue gray and it's intense. So we're in increasing the value and we're increasing the saturation. So more blue and a smaller amount of its complement, which um, is wonderful. I'm going to get some of this burnt sienna and bring it over here, just get some ready so that I'm dipping in and out of it. That's just ready for me. It's beautiful. This is my water brush. This is the one for the beautiful blue. And now it's time to play with purple. Let's see what it looks like. Do I want it? That's the other thing about a ceramic palette is that Oh, it's a fabulous purple. Oh, very excited about that one. That is permanent violet. It might live beautifully permanently on my uh, palette. Okay, I've got this beautiful purple. I've got this blue, deep blue-gray. And um, I've got some... Um, beautiful ultra, um, <laughs> burnt sienna over here. And I'm using, apart from introducing my purple, I'm using the same colours uh, that I used here, that I used there, oh, except for the uh, quinacridone gold. So I might include a little bit of that as well. <clears throat> I'm getting a little bit uh, warmer now. Um, spring is coming, which is very, very cool. Now, back to my watery brush. I'm going to mix a little bit of this purple and this brown so it'll be a very desaturated grayish color. But again, because I'm uh -oh, because I'm working with a limited palette, I because I'm working with a limited palette, it's not a, a problem for me to be using to be mixing a gray from the colors that I'm uh, using. Also, they're very beautifully transparent colors. I'm coming in on this angle and I want it wider at the bottom and then it gets thinner as it goes up. Uh, but yeah, okay, putting it in with this color is quite good. Very watery at this stage. And then I want to um, keep this beautiful uh, texture here. So I'm going to make the tree go around it and up there and come back to my grey. And this side can come out like that. Is that a bit too obvious that I've left those two there? Kind of is, isn't it? Okay, definitely wants an extra branch coming up there and then there'll be a series of small branches. Okay, worth looking now at what does it actually do. Oh, there's beautiful um, bark hanging off it and some of it comes off at the front and does this. I do not want to take too long on the watery stage because while it's beautiful and wet, is my opportunity to drop in on this side, beautiful dark tones. I don't want to see the painting behind it. Well, having said that, I don't think it matters that much if you do see the painting behind it. Let's grab some burnt sienna. <coughs> I head away, but uh, apologies. I can't move the microphone away. Okay, burnt sienna. Oh, and it's mixing on the page. I do need a little bit of tone on the other side to indicate that's the bark that's peeling off. It's um, It comes oh, straight down like that, actually. I think, no, some of them do turn. That's lovely where they turn. Bit of blue up there that I'm going to interrupt. Uh, there, I don't want that blue up there. And I do want it darker for two reasons. It's going to bring my beautiful tree forward. Oh, I've got a lump there. Will I leave it in there? You do find them all the top. Viv says, yes, my cherry blossoms are looking like my neck. Oh, I have a cherry blossom too, Viv. I abs oh, purple time. I absolutely love this time of year. And a cherry blossom teaches you stuff like enjoy the moment because Spring comes and those beautiful flowers pop out 
from your blossom trees. I'm just adding purple rand in random spots. The flowers bloom and then inevitably there's a uh, wind that will come along, pick up the blooms and spread them all around the place. I don't mind the lump. I'm undecided about it. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to change it a little bit. Okay, I'm loving that one there. It needs some brown, smaller branches coming off. And again, I'm going to be thinking about what they do in this image. The other thing I could be thinking about is how they are covering bits in your background. Nice opportunity for that. I'm going to soften with my water brush. That's just getting rid of the excess moisture. I'm going to soften the ends of that. I don't want interest at that level of the painting. That can be one of those. Oh, let's just take that off with my soft brush. Not take it off, tra make it travel. Make it travel, travel, travel. Oh, I'm enjoying putting those little bark bits over here in the. Um, yeah, see that point, it's it's really, it's kind of dull, a dull point to be using for detail. So don't do that. Get out a <laughs> line of brush. Um, but I don't mind that way that that has filled it up. Now, in my image, it's got this lovely little knob here with these broken bits. Let's go to my liner brush and let's go into the burnt sienna first. And it's got a knob there. And then it's got as though there was a branch at some point that fell off. And let's have give it some purple just because I like purple. No good reason. And then I'm going to give that teensy bit of detail water and just to spread it around and... I did want it to look like a knob, but it no longer looks like a knob. <clears throat> Excuse me. I need to expand it. That's why it doesn't look like a knob. Um, it comes out from there. So dark. Oh, that's better. And then it can come up there. Again, a little bit of tone on this side. Grab my little... Um, liner brush and I know I'm not actually painting a scribbly gum but I want to put in some texture. I'm just adding in bits of burnt sienna. Oh there's a dip there, interesting and more detail, more detail, more texture. Perhaps there's a strokey, oh there's lovely dark lines coming up here purple there more purple thicker purple now add some of that gray blue and now I've got a purpley gray and Viv says can't wait for my jacaranda oh, you've got a jacaranda I would love a jacaranda there used to be a jacaranda oh there's a nice bit of bark on this bottom here there used to be a, the most magnificent jacaranda on the corner uh, on my street and um they built a new house and they left it there. And at first I was like, oh, so excited that they left a, um, this needs detail. I'm so excited that they left it. I'm looking for my palette knife so that I can do a bit of um, detail uh, there. Luckily I've got another palette knife because I think the other one is with the just scratching off a bit so that, put it over there, so that this has a bit of, um, uh, sit, sit, will look a little bit like it's sitting forward there. Now I'm going to make this branch come in front with a little bit of scraping, a little bit of texture, this one like that. Take off a little bit of tone here, create the texture there. Now this branch, is it going to, I'm going to make that one go in front and be in front. This one can be behind. Therefore, we continue the trunk down there. A bit wet, just drag it for a few seconds. 
Okay, a bit of detail in terms of some barky kind of stuff. Oh my gosh, it's 11.09. I don't think we're going to get the other painting completed. I think by the time I've done this, I'll be lucky to have completed one painting. Okay, how's that going? Not bad. Little bits of bark. I'm really, really enjoying this one's bark as well, but I'm going to wait to do that. Okay, now then. We're using, we're talking about space today. I've used texture because it's in the foreground and that's bringing it forward. I've used darker tones. Again, that's bringing that forward, but only in comparison to the light tones. My values are darker and um, my colours are more pure, more, less saturated, more saturated. In fact, that brown is bothering me a lot. Pick up some of this blue and uh, add blue into there but it's also um, a bit of water right at the top so I'm gonna make it appear like nothing get a tissue and get rid of some of that don't want interest up there and um, I've got this liner I think I'll um, add some more little branches. Uh, I know that uh, it wouldn't be so little there, so I'm just going to expand the base of it. And I just want to delicately um, increase the foreground here and go over with my liner brush the area where those trees are sitting, and that's going to push them back further because this is crisp, a beautiful crisp edge. Crisp edge, crisp edge. Oh, I just love that bit of purple. It's not even slightly in my uh, image. And, um, oh, so tempting sometimes just to leave it there. Uh, Helen says, think I have a new descriptive word for my painting. Thanks, Lena. What fast. <laughs> and Helen says, love your texture. And um, there's a funny little um, symbol on my screen that covers the, in the next word. Love your texture and something are fabulous. Thank you, Helen. Whatever that extra word is that I can't see. I'll be able to see it in a minute. Anyway. Is my trunk fatter at the bottom and going up and getting thinner? Yeah, this one is way too fat, but that ship has sailed. I could make this a little wider, but I'd kind of liked what I did there. If you want to do more textures, the um, textural moment is uh, probably now. Um, I like the little scribbly gum look that I gave it, a bit of... Uh, I don't need to put texture in there, do I? Uh, what the hell? Oh, that's nice. And this bit is just keeps drawing my eye and I just don't know why. So I'm going to add random bits. Uh, right, this is... Oh, I know. Scratch out so it looks like it's folding out. Oh, did that work? Oh, they were stupid marks down there, weren't they? Oh, fold out. Does that look a bit more like it's folding out? Just staring at it for a moment to decide what I think. Uh, right, let's get on to the other tree. Excellent. Uh, two trees on this side go back to the same method I was using, which was, I've got brushes everywhere now, um, a beautiful watery batch of purple with a little bit of brown and a little bit of blue. It's just really, really watery so that I can put the tree down, <clears throat> excuse me, and then come straight in for the detail. I'll do the one on this side first. 
So perhaps that one could go off in the corner. Um, like, uh, yep, yeah, okay, just commit, commit tree and then get thinner as you go up the page. A bit more water, watery paint, fat down there. And I wanted the branches to go higher, start branching off a little higher. And I'm not going to take too long with this part because I want to get straight into the wet and wet process. Okay, nicely different from the other, different angle. So I'm happy with that. Now, lovely darks, being consistent about the light coming that side and hitting over here, starting in with those dark, dark, dark colors, dark, 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 dark. Uh, and again, thank you for the thumbs up. I am um, so grateful that you're saying stuff like you like it. This is Conacred and Gold. It's, there's a bit of um, burnt sienna on my brush, but I'm going in with and God, so it's a little bit different to the other one. Oh, I've got a fabulously irregular mark there. There's not many gum trees that look like that, but, boy, there's some beautiful Australian trees that have insane levels of um, bark. Okay, I'm trying really hard to think about the negative space. <clears throat> Excuse me. That different, that different, that different, and that is beautifully different from that. I'm pretty pleased with that. I'm going to grab and get going with the next one. Here's the next one. And according to my little design here, there's going to be a small space. And if this one is tilting in, this one's going to be reasonably straight. Okay, fat at the bottom and slim off as you come up and come up and I'm really glad I've got a little bit of a design there to help me come up and it's going to touch the other tree. More watery paint, watery, watery. Um, it's very fat down there actually, isn't it? Uh, maybe it has a branch there and then, then that branch could either go that way or stop or Right, and it comes up here and it goes over that one. And then, oh, see, I went too fat. That branch, would it really be like that? That's better. <laughs> um, uh, this one can come over into this lovely um, space here. I haven't done anything in this space. So definitely a nice opportunity <laughs> to put in some, oh, don't be too random, Marion. Uh, I don't know whether you all paint and talk to yourself madly, but my husband has recently retired and he commented, he said, when you're creating, because I do all sorts of creative stuff, he said, did you know that you talk to yourself? I talk to myself all day long when I'm creating. If I'm doing something tedious, you know, like washing, packing the dishwasher, blah, blah, all that boring stuff you do when you're um, living in a space. And uh, I don't talk at all during that. That's <laughs> so boring. I'm going in for burnt sienna. And I'm putting the burnt sienna over the blue. And, oh, I mustn't forget the purple. Grab a dob of purple. I'm loving the purple. Or maybe this one, <coughs> excuse me, maybe this one can have the purple and this has very little purple. Oh, I know. I'm going to put purple at the base of the tree. Oh, I haven't done any dotties. I'm not going to splatter because I don't want to um, protect all of that from splattering. So I'm just going to do little dotties with my brush. Susan says, hi, Marion. When you get a chance in the future, could you put up a photo with the paint palette you're using and what colours in the setting up? Setting up my palette is something I struggle with, Sue. Well, that is awesome that you've asked that because this morning I put up exactly what you're talking about, a video that is all about this palette and the colours that live there permanently. 
So if you go to my channel, it's the most recent upload and you'll find it there. With uh, And there's also an, another video I have about um, my palette and you'll find that Helen's um, been making some encouraging comments there. Thank you, Helen. I love that you do that. And Susan's is awesome. Thank you. That's so cool that you like. I'm going to make this touch. Make this one touch. Make them combine and go over that branch. We want these branches not so much to look like they're holding hands. It's doing a bit of that, isn't it? But um, to make them look like they are integrated, like they uh, you want your shapes to touch. That's kind of um, a rule that I use, and rule's never the right word, is it? It's a guideline that I pretty much paint by, which is get your objects to overlap. That's another type of perspective. Um, putting this tree in front of that tree, putting this tree in front of that tree uh, is a type of perspective. It's a, a stacking perspective. I'm not sure whether or not that's the actual term, is stacking perspective, but uh, you get the point. You stack an object in front of a, another um, object. And we're kind of doing that. Look how the background has been completely lost. And that's why I was like, oh, just get going with the painting because um, that background is becomes nothing. If, if we're lucky, it just gets pushed right back. So I had all those beautiful little um, splattery bits and uh, I've lost them. Uh, and it doesn't matter because this is an exercise in, um, I'm going to do some scratching out. Is this an exercise in creating space and partic in particular we're using aerial perspective to create depth in the painting. Now if I scratch that one like this, it goes over the front of that tree. I like that look that it might go over the front. I'm using the palette knife to create some extra little marks and uh, also give the tree some tone. Let's go over here. When it's beautifully wet, you'll get, um, go upwards. When it's, that looks a bit like grass, I'll just get rid of that. When it's beautifully wet, the uh, its ability, I'm going to put it on an angle, it's Really, really shove that under there. Um, Viv says, gorgeous, can't wait to give it a go. Wonderful, Viv. And Helen says, I was thinking I would need to fill all the spaces on the palette until I saw yours. Yeah, totally. Stick with colours that you love and give the colours that you love the special spots. And um, I want that some contrast there. Okay, let's think about which branches are in front and which are behind. This one can be in front, 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 front. Scratch you down to there. This one can be in front. Scratch you down there. I'm going to go back into this one here. So much for my let's do two paintings today. Way ambitious. Bit of scratching there. I'm loving that bit there. That, that's all right. I'm going to scratch off some of that though. This one, that's working nicely that that's sitting in front. However, it's um, not really conforming to the system I had going of light on this side and dark on that. So that would need to be dry in order for me to scratch any further into that. Oh, I like that look. You're scratching out and it picks up the paint and then you can make beautiful scratchy marks. I'll lighten that side, lighten that side. Oh, just going for it now. Lighten, 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 lighten. So sometimes I'm putting it flat and sometimes I'm um, uh, doing the side of the palette knife or something. Uh, yeah, Susan, thank you for asking. This is a Quiller palette and... Um, I don't know what size it is. I don't have, <laughs> uh, it's wide. <laughs> if I put, um, oh, it's about elbow to wrist width. So, and my arms, I'm not a, a tall person. Uh, so, I don't know, that long? <laughs> 
That was helpful, wasn't it? Okay, now. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, look at that scratching. That's what we want. Oh, that's cool. I like that. Now it's sitting in front, isn't it? Okay, anywhere else I need to add some? Uh, Susan says, <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, that's funny, isn't it? Okay. I'm just going to leave them for a moment. <laughs> I was just going nuts with my uh, palette knife. It's a little bit hilarious. I need more darks. So going back to my palette here, uh, what shall I add the darks with? I know. The same grey. So, yes, it's desaturated. I'm adding it with um, – it's a grey, and it, I am desaturating the blue but my tone is dark and I want some of these beautiful darks to pop. Let's put it around that branch so that branch really looks like it's in front. Give some – so some of my branches are looking a bit like um, – some of my trunks are looking – the tone is kind of evening out because I was painting wet and wet. So we know that watercolour dries. 10 to 15% lighter. Acrylics dry darker. But in watercolour, we've got so much water, well, especially the way it, uh, um, I love to paint, so much water, darken there and make that branch come forward, so much water that uh, it looks brighter and lighter or more intense, that kind of thing. And then as the water evaporates, then you lose that beautiful um, glossiness but we're expecting it, so we're, we're not worried by that. And what you're left with are glorious colours but less tone. So that's why I'm going back in to add more tone. That's a bit odd, the way I just painted that. So I'm going to put in a bit of texture with the side of my brush. I've just joined those marks up a little bit bit of texture. If I hold it flat um, and drag it across the surface, I'll get lovely textural marks. Helen says, think mine is the same, 330 millimetres square. Thank you, Helen. Yeah, I reckon that's a good 33 centimetres because 30 centimetres, like if you think about a rule, is there, smack on. Thanks, Helen. That's awesome. Helen just bought uh, so you can ask Helen stuff. <laughs> Do you like me offering your help there, Helen? Actually, Helen's lovely. She won't mind, I bet. Uh, more grey. Anywhere else wants more grey? This is a big mess. This branch needs to be separated from that branch. So how am I going to do that? I push that one back, bring this one forward. I'm going to make this branch come here like that and like that. And I know if with into that thick paint, I will scratch out the – that's a bit better, isn't it? It's just given it a little more uh, separation. It might be the sort of thing that I deal with tomorrow. Oh, we are so close. We are so close. Fantastic. Now – Let's go back to the big one. What did I put in the middle? So I've got this big space here and all I've got are little shadowy marks and some little soft flickers. Um, sometimes I add little, little bits of grass. I've added in little bits of texture, but we do need to fill this space. And I so want to show you my um, the other painting. Actually, I have a few things to show you. I'm just going to finish this off just in case you need to go. Let's put in – oh. I know. Let's let's uh, splatter splatter water 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 over here as well, and over here as well, over here, over here. The really big one, so it's pretty big droplets, and um, oh, perhaps it'd be some lovely green. Uh, so let's mix our own green. Need to get rid of that and. Um, okay, I need space on my palette 
because I want to mix a green. So just create a bit of space here. Loved using that purple. That was cool. And another brush. Susan says that is beautiful. Thank you. I love that you think so. Um, right, there's my quinacridone and gold. It's got a little bit of um, burnt sienna in it, but that's all right. I oh, you know I'm going to go back to the cobalt. It will make a brighter green because there's no red in cobalt, whereas ultramarine has a little bit of red. Oh, that green is beautiful. Now I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to add more water and go a watery version, watery, start with the watery version. So perhaps I'm um, just going to get another brush. Helen says, one tip from experience is to write the name of the colour in text on the side of the palette. Absolutely. If I could lift, oh, you could see a little bit there, uh, cerulean chromium. It's hard to see now. But in the beginning, that's exactly what I did, Helen. Thank you for saying that. Um, down here it says peacock blue, which I need to get rid of because I've stopped using that colour. Not that it's not lovely. Um, cerulean. Uh, it used to say viridian, but again, it doesn't say that anymore. And over here I've written sodalite because that's what's sitting in this part of my palette. And um, I bet there's something over there. But, yes, uh, in the beginning I did a lot, a lot of um, uh, – a lot of writing the names down while I became familiar. So a little bit of splatter. Won't matter at all that it goes over these trees. It will matter if it goes on my jacket. I'm wearing a new jacket. And uh, I guess I'm christening it. <laughs> okay. I want the big drops because I'm going to see if I can do some more blowing. Uh, I'm going to add purple. Love purple and green, purple, 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 and add purple down here. Oh, too viscous, doesn't want to drip. There, more water, drips away brilliantly. Okay, so it doesn't look like anything at the moment because it isn't anything at the moment, it's just a stack of drips. Now, bit of an angle and <sighs> blow. This one I blew into the painting. I blew up, up a bit. I just love the random nature of that. Won't matter at all that it's going over the trees. Okay, it created lovely little marks here. I'm going to use my finger to move them around, bring them down. Uh, anchor some of them perhaps, a little bit of water there, and those didn't do anything. So I'm just getting rid of that. that I, I really like it to the background when you're adding it at the end like that. I really like them to touch um, because otherwise it looks like you did come to the end and you're like, oh, there's a little space. I think I'll fill something in. So make these bits and pieces come in contact with the tree, make them contact. I'm just doing my finger. It gives a slightly different mark. And uh, so weird that I just occasionally use my finger like that. Okay, some dark little dotty things there. That is cool. Let's increase the dark dotty bits down here and go back into that green and with a lovely flick of the brush, flick, flick, uh, some grasses. It's going to go over the tree. I know, a bit risky. Um, it does push the tree back a tiny bit. Oh, I dropped some there. Oh, that's lovely. I'm going to blow that one. <gasps> Did nothing. I'm going to turn it upside down. Great idea to turn it upside down. <laughs> it's like this fresh look at what's going on and what's jumping out at me are the negative spaces because I'm no longer seeing them as trees. I'm seeing them as shapes. And this negative space is different to this, different, 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 different. Wow, I'm going to say that I achieved 
a really great uh, range of negative spaces. Um, that is pretty um, exciting. I want these grasses to go up like this in really given the palette knife a run for its money. Mm, should I make it that high? I need to turn it back around to see that. Wow, you're like a magician of your style. Well, that is a high compliment. Thank you so much. Okay, loving the scratch there. This did not need to be that high. I am going to get a water brush, clean water brush, and see if I can just remove. I don't, I don't, I just felt that that was um, kind of interfering with the success of my trees okay now if i wanted to make a joke i'd be like hey let's go back to the other one and put the trees in but definitely not today there's some other things i wanted to show you while i'm showing you that it's going to give my brain a lovely little break from this painting and i'm going to set it down i have a pile of stuff to show you just my move that to there and I'm just going to um, put them here but I'm just thinking about the fact that I need something clean here. <coughs> Two clean pieces of paper. I don't want anything to touch what I'm about to show you. This is what, oh, push it up so you can see. This is what I've been doing with my watercolour paintings. I have a big pile of them. You, I am a prolific artist. I love painting fast. I love, um, oh, don't want any of my little dangles there to touch anything mucky. They are all so beautiful and clean. Fresh ribbons I've got there. So what I do with my watercolour paintings, I used to sell them. I used to put them up and sell them. I used to exhibit all the time. I used to do all that kind of stuff. And um, then I just got into teaching more and realised that teaching is like a regular income versus the randomness of selling stuff. And also, I don't like selling stuff. I don't like self promotion and if you're exhibiting you need to have the ability to either pay someone to sell for you which really uh, I was never going to afford be able to afford that um, I'm just checking my hands before I touch I'm going to wipe them down here I do not want to um, do any marks on my beautiful uh, journals so where I was going is I no longer um, exhibit I don't even do much online exhibiting because that just involves lots and lots of time where you go and you take lots of photos. And I used to be on um, Blue, 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 what's that one called? Blue. I'm moving this further out of the way so I cannot accidentally put a mark on my, put that one down there. Okay. Uh, so what I do now with my paintings is cut them up. So. For example, this one, this is, these are all junk journals I'm showing you today. I do a range of other stuff as well. So that's the painting. You may have seen that one on Instagram. And then you fold it over. It, um, some of the paint, some of the beautiful papers, because I generally used 300 GSM, some of them split. So I reinforced it with some black book binding tape. And then um, I don't know if any of you recognize that painting. So again, I've cut it up and you start to create uh, little pockets. You, you can slip stuff in there. That will become more obvious in a moment. I do lots of styles of journals. So again, I'll open this one out. These are the signatures. This None of these are finished. These are the signatures that I'm working on to place inside. So there again is a lovely painting. I'm just checking my ribbons aren't touching anything. Uh, so there is a painting. That one was done with uh, cheesecloth. Really easy, really, really, really good fun. So that's a painting cut up and you mount it on, I've been mounting them on um, cereal boxes generally. And then there's another painting and I've cut it up and I embellish and stuff like that. Uh, that will be a three signature 
um, junk journal and then you put all these beautiful journals inside them and they include just turn that so you can see it some um, lots of my paintings so I fold the paintings I print my paintings and make little pockets I that's a whole painting um, that I love that painting and uh, that'll do for that one I'm going to uh, we're just waiting for the painting to dry while I show you some of these. So this is a single signature. Just put the signature there and again show you. So blue thumb. Thanks, Helen. That's it. So um, this is a landscape and it uh, was done at the same time as the big one that we've been working off today. Distant trees and uh, then some lovely grasses. Oh, that's a cool idea. Let's do that with the one that we've been doing here. Little tiny. Um, uh, accents to the grasses and when you stare at grasses they totally do have these little things anyway you fold your painting over and you gather um, what's called a signature and then I'm going to be sewing all of these in and um, selling junk journals instead here's another landscape that way and then um, again so when I bound them it's because the paper was so thick that it split on the edge and then so this one I bound it over there oh I forgot to show you the inside again another painting that I've cut up uh, again I'm placing the signatures quite carefully because I've put them in a very specific order um, that's one of those super easy landscapes if we did that one week we would be done in 20 minutes really really lovely with a bit of um, crayon and again the inside of the junctionals is filled with my art as well look at this one I've done a little bit of collage because this one has a boating theme I'll just show you the outside of that one again so you can see why oh and I've been using my sewing machine so that one was a landscape with boats and then I collage the inside um, that's a bit that I cut off the painting and I've got a little tiny boat down here and then I've collaged a boat and then throughout this one it's full of little tiny boat references or water references stuff like that oh that's another one of those you I've just shown you one just like that this one I'm in love with this is going to be hard to um, sell because you know how you get an emotional attachment firstly love this painting it did actually go and I'm really hoping you don't notice but it did go this way it was a landscape it was a um, series of abstract figures I absolutely loved it and I've owned it for years and it's one of those ones I couldn't sell what do I do and anyway so I've committed and um, did lots of sewing on the inside. You can see uh, a whole painting. That was a, a beautiful still life that I painted. And I tell you what, sometimes cutting up my own paintings really is um, it's a bit of an emotional thing to do because if the painting represents something for you or you painted at a certain time, all that kind of stuff, um, turning them into a junk journal it can be really uh, hard to do. Um, right, just going to put them away. That's one of the many things I do with, it's quite heavy now, with my paintings. If I win lotto, I'm going to hire someone to come in and sell all my paintings. I really have hundreds. Um, now, Let's do what I just thought of then. Little on these grasses, add little tiny. Oh, it's wet. Oh, that's kind of cool. So it's spreading a little bit. Less paint. It's not wet there. Uh, it's very wet there. What about over here? Less paint. Dotty, dotty. Oh, that's kind of cool though. I'm enjoying that. That one, I'm going to increase the detail there and then it goes dot, dot, dot. So grasses really do have like little um, little seed pods on the end. Let's go purple. I'm going to dip into the purple here that is, uh, like that's practically straight out of the tube. I don't want to draw any more focus here. Let's, oh, I like this one here, purple with the green. Is that dry? No, that's wet as well. 
if you want to take your time with these, if, um, you know, you're thinking about investing more time in a painting, which I sometimes do, uh, then you could wait till it's dry and add the little dots. Helen says, gorgeous. Could we do something like the last abstract cover? The one with the people, Helen, is that what you're referring to? I'll just get it out and put it separate in case you really um, like that one. So how, that one? That, yeah, right, yeah. So actually really easy to do. Yep, I'd love to do that with you guys. Uh, wax paper we need or people also use um, foil, baking paper, but I just absolutely love um, wax paper and wax paper and then I've gone around the whole thing with a black water soluble marker and that's how I did that one I'd love to show you that one thanks for asking okay well a couple of things I am just fill my screen with this one this one has a real ghost gummy um, kind of misty morning look to it misty evening and this one doesn't at all. I just um, have, I take great delight in doing something a bit different each time. Viv says, love those. I just made a whole stack of greeting cards with mine yesterday. Yeah, that's that's the other thing that I do too. Yeah, I know Viv is a, a card maker, which is wonderful. What a great thing to do with your um, uh, watercolours is cut them up. Of course, selling them if you... Uh, have that energy then um, do that that's really really cool okay I've got these lovely little seed heady things here but I'm feeling like it's um, desperate uh, to have some detail over here super I'm going to go in with the green it had purple on it but I'm not watching um, over that <laughs> it says mine yes I totally I guess that actually uh, watery I want to go this level, watery green. We've got a foreground. We've got a background. There's nothing much in the middle distance. So if I put in some small grasses, so long grasses here, smaller at this point, and again, touch, although they're not in front, touch, that's nice and dark. You're never, not going to see that mark. So some ones that fall over as well because grasses do that falling over thing, don't they? They, I mean, they grow tall at first and then as soon as they get to a certain length, they uh, tumble over. Now I'm going to get a purpley grayish mix and continue adding a little bit of detail there. That mark is odd. Just get rid of the that. One there and some little tiny bits here. Is it wet there? Yeah, it's wet. That's kind of cool. That's going to knock it back very nicely. Oh, happy accident. On oh, And then go over to here and, again, go over the tree. It's so easy to cover later, but you get that connection rather than anything um, odd. Now, it's a bit odd that it's uh, straight as in straight like that. So let's bring these down here. I'm going down, but I actually would like to go up, up like that. And again, let's put in some that I'm switching to the green. And that's why I like having all this color over here. Um, Susan says, I've just ordered some 300 GSM A5 cards from UK. Susan, that's very interesting. I'd um, love to know uh, what price you paid because I'm totally nearly ready to order another box. Um, and Viv says they make fabulous gifts. Don't they, Viv? Don't people love them? And Susan says, yes, that's my plan. This Friday I love giving them. I oh, me too. So do you paste your art on front, Susan and Viv? Oh, good question. I'm going to let you guys answer. The card makers can give tips. I'd love to know about glues as well. We should so do card making and especially with all those wonderful um, tips and tricks. Okay. Again, 
this um, I do want it to connect, but uh, I'm going to wipe it off as soon as I put it on because the green I will see. So let's say we connect, connect, connect like that, off, off like that, and make some fall over, fall over behind it there, uh, there, and this brush is damp. Just get rid of the moisture. Uh, oh, I know, better still. Let's see if we can get the edge of this tree trunk with a scratch. Mm, not really. Oh, I think I'm. <laughs> I think I'm doing uh, digging in. Um, because I do have some cards that I just can't part with. Too. <laughs> ah, I so understand. Right, little bit of purple, pure purple, pure purple, straight out of the tube. Let's give it some little. Now the the dots actually don't appear at the end. I'm putting them on the end, but when you look at the grasses, it's just near the end. It's uh, it's kind of just below it, and I guess they're uh, that a version of grassy flowers, aren't they? Okay, that's better. It comes up. This is the middle ground we're talking about. It comes up. It goes up there. It goes there. So therefore, we need some here, pale green, and let's come down and down to here. Go into the green again green over the purple and go over the tree. Make those beautiful shapes connect. Connect, connect, connect. And we are so done. I'm going to put in a tiny bit of detail just there. Uh, Susan says, I'm going to paint straight onto card. They came with envelopes, bought off eBay, $2.50 each. Thank you for that info. That is fabulous. I will, um, I don't actually know what I paid for the last box. So, but thank you for sharing the info. That's cool. I'm putting in a little tiny, um, I haven't touched my magenta. Does it need a bit of magenta? Does See, if, now if I put magenta in there, I'll draw focus in there. Do I want that? Eh, I don't know. Um, Helen says, you must be confident, Susan. Actually, I thoroughly agree because I only ever glue and I like to cut out and I'm also I just love gluing. It takes me back to um, childhood in terms of um, makes me think about those. I'm just putting in more little marks here. This is bothering me a little bit. So with a wet brush and a touch of green, I'm just going to add a little bit of texture so my brush is low. I just want to, in, I don't know, texture, it's in the foreground. Just want to change that a little bit. It was bothering me. Bit of texture, bit of texture. It's got to be dry. Yeah, that's better. That's, that's a bit better. I'm going to say it's done. Susan says, no, I'll attempt it. <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> Uh, well, that'd be cool to hear how you're going. I don't know on this one, but geez, that was really good fun. Thank you so much for hanging around. Thank you for commenting and interacting and asking stuff and asking each other stuff, which is very cool. I'm really, really enjoying that. Now, this was the seventh in our series of seven, the seven elements of art. There are also seven principles of art and I'd really like to go into that one. Now, I mentioned um, a couple of weeks ago when I skipped a week, I had a couple of doctor's appointments and I went to the skin specialist and, you know, they burn you. That's not the blue stuff. That's me um, doing spray painting yesterday. Uh um, yeah, so unfortunately, more doctor's appointments coming up. This is one of those, you know, you're getting older and your body just doesn't want to do all those stuff, that stuff. So next couple of weeks, no YouTube live. Then let's start back with, we won't go into the principles straight away. Let's do this beauty. I love that idea. It's really easy. It won't be near such a long session. I can't believe it's 
like midday and you've all hung with me. I am so, so, so chuffed that you would all hang around. This will be our next project. It's so easy. You can use any colors you like and it won't be a big long session like today. But geez, that was good that you hung around. I really, really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much, guys. I will schedule the next one so you'll be able to see the dates up on YouTube Live. And um, Lena says, good luck with the medical stuff. I know, isn't it? Uh, well, at least in Australia, we have the an excellent um, health system. So uh, my daughter had to be rushed to hospital with an ectopic pregnancy. And that was um, dealt with with the most incredible, I'm going to put a shout out now to Sutherland Hospital. She was dealt with absolute professionalism and it was just extraordinary. Um, so my point is we're, we're, we're lucky. We're really, really, really lucky. Helen says, I'll just put you on repeat for the next two weeks. Thank you, Helen. That is really cool because there's so much that I've got up there and I've gotten much better at videos and these YouTube lives. I uh, haven't had any uh, technical difficulties for weeks, so that's been really cool. Viv says, yes, I do map them and add embellishments. Ah. Oh, I love that idea, Viv. That is so cool. Uh, thank you so much, guys. I will see you in about three weeks' time. I, and as I say, I will put all those dates up. Thank you so much for joining me. That was absolutely wonderful and I loved all your interaction. And uh, see you in a few weeks' time. Bye, guys.